Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to another keynote from the Global Education Conference. We're closing out day four, if you can believe it. This is our fifth keynote of the day, and we're really delighted to have Larry Johnson here. Larry, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's uh, it's great to be here, and I can hear four days of conference hosting in your voice. I'm sure you're you're looking forward to some sleep in the over the weekend. <laughs> it's been a fantastic <laughs> event, though. It is a really fun event. We know that because everybody's switching at the top of the hour, people will come in as we get moving forward. But we do want to make sure that our presenters have the full hour. So we are going to get going, and then please do welcome anybody who comes in the room afterwards. Let them know you're glad they're here. Thanks to our conference sponsors and supporters this year. What a terrific outpouring of support we've had. Especially, we would like to thank IRON for just a terrific partnership this year. Uh, we're hosting the IRON annual conference at the same time, and that's been a lot of fun to coordinate. This is a chance for those of you who are currently in the live audience to let us know where you're listening from and give Larry a sense of the global aspect of the conference. I'm glad Anne is here because we'll see Australia on the map. You're looking for the star to the left of the map. Click on that twice, then click on the map. Do have a shout out in the chat. How fun. And as people come in the room, encourage them to let you know where they're from. So the whole purpose of the conference is to make connections. So hopefully you'll find that you have ways to do that as we hear from Larry. Larry, I'm going to turn the time over to you. Again, thank you so much for rearranging to be here. We know you had a tough week, and we appreciate it. <clears throat> thank you, Steve. And thanks to the folks that are here and uh, those that are joining as we go. Um, I think it's still a good Twitter etiquette to limit yourself to two hashtags. So if your first one is the conference hashtag, uh, perhaps the second one might be this one, uh, which is the official NMC hashtag that we use for everything that we do. Um, this is a great uh, Twitter stream to follow. It is the way to let us know about what you're doing, your projects, um, and uh, just in, in general, it's a good way to find out what's going on with all things Horizon, so I encourage you to uh, keep track of that. What we're going to do today is talk uh, about some insights that, um, that are mine. They're my personal insights from now nearly 11 years of doing this work. It'll be 11 years in January. And um, so we're going to take it uh, in some some different sorts of directions, perhaps than uh, than we might otherwise. But I am going to go over some of the Horizon research to start, and I'll do that right now. Um, but I'm going to note as we get started, we use a lot of photography uh, in the session to illustrate things. And one of the points I'm going to try and make is uh, the, the importance of looking at things. Um, seriously, to, to look at things with uh, a very um, learned eye, a way of, of understanding what you're seeing and, and the things that you're not seeing as well. And so hopefully some of the photographs will illustrate that as we go along. Most of them are mine, but if they aren't, I've, I've noted who they were on the slide. So um, I'm going to start off with this shot, which I like. Um, because it helps me to think about perspective. This is from the top of the Marina Sands in Singapore. And it's a group of uh, Europeans that are looking over what's arguably one of the most amazing cities in the world uh, from one of the most amazing buildings in the world. Uh, but it's a very different perspective than you typically see about Singapore and tells a very different sort of story. And that's what I'm going to try and do today. The Horizon Project now, as I said, has been around for 11 years. And over that time, <clears throat> we've published 27 editions. We're, we have two more editions in process as I speak. So that will soon be 29. And then we kick off the K-12 in, in the uh, 
in the spring, we'll, we'll round that off to 30. It's been translated 37 times into 10 languages. And uh, it's, it represents quite a body of work anymore. We do a number of, of different sorts of research under the uh, Horizon banner. And the ones that are probably best known are the Horizon reports themselves. We do three of those. There's one aimed um, at higher education globally, one aimed at primary and secondary education worldwide. Thank you, Peggy. It's really nice you to put the link up. Uh, and one aimed at informal education, uh, which we do through the lens of museums. And that will be the very next one that's released, by the way. But we do a number of special reports as well that have a, a smaller our tighter focus. Uh, so we have a number of people from Australia. I'm sure you're aware that we do an Australian uh, Horizon Report each year. Uh, going forward, that report's going to be sponsored by the Open University of Australia. And uh, so I want to do a big shout out to them for helping us keep the project going. We also do an annual report for New Zealand for uh, Latin America. We just uh, are publishing one this week for Brazil. Uh, we published one a month ago in Singapore. We're looking at other reports in Asia. We've done them in the UK. Uh, we have one planned for the European Union. And uh, further down the road, um, we are in conversations with institutions in both Africa and India. Um, and the project is just growing. It's growing like topsy. The, um, the regional reports have given us uh, a whole new way of of looking at technology around the world, it's kind of exciting. Um, now, I mentioned that we're in our 11th year. When we marked our 10th anniversary last January, we had a very special event, and both the hosts of this conference were there. Um, and we we went into retreat for three days. You can see the record of it at this URL uh, on the slides, and spent the time initially thinking about what have we learned over 10 years of looking at where technology is going and what of that that we learned might we apply to the future. It was a fascinating three days. There were 100 people in the room that had served on Horizon Project Advisory Boards there from 20 countries and it was, it was just, you know, just incredibly excitement filled. About halfway through, we began to move to looking at what we called metatrends. Um, these were the sorts of trends that we expected would persist for the foreseeable future. The next 10 years was the frame that we had. We spent a lot of time talking about them. We identified more than 30 uh, and ranked them and ultimately published a list of 10, and um, this is the beginning of that list, and I just want to highlight a few of them. First off, I want to highlight that this group of experts, and really the experts that we work with worldwide, which is now a group of about 700, um, increasingly feel that the decisions we make about technology are being driven not by the technology it, itself, but by changes in society and in changes in the way that people expect for um, expect to be able to learn, work, play, socialize. Um, and at the top of the list, they looked to the world of work and noted that it was increasingly global and collaborative with some very important implications, uh, notably that cultural awareness was a very, very important in a way that it hasn't been in a long, long time. Um, there was a colleague in the room from Mila Panther and he said, you know, we go to the best schools in the world. The, the top universities are hire the people that work at HP. We're looking for the smartest people we can find and, and so that's how, we, that's how we find them and that's how we hire them. But he said, do you know why we fire them? Why we let them go? And the reason was because they can't work in groups or they're not uh, able to take advantage of um, 
the, the nuances, not take advantage is not the right word, but to uh, capitalize on the, the nuances that uh, multiculturalism brings to uh, uh, work effort. It was a fascinating point, one that I think is very important. Something um, that we all need to think about is the top of the list. And then people expect to be able, uh, particularly young people, expect to be able to work, learn, socialize, and do whatever they want to do. They want to do it whenever and wherever they want to. Uh, now, that may sound uh, a little egotistical, but, but it's not. It's actually the way that many of us work. We work wherever we, wherever we can, basically, uh, to get the work done. And it's a, it's a big change in the notion of work as a place to work as an activity. Um, and, of course, a big piece of that is the Internet. The, we couldn't do the kinds of things that we uh, have been doing uh, without the global network, and increasingly, and I mean very much so, it's a mobile network that we access the Internet on. Nearly 90% of the people in the world, including myself, access the um, Internet primarily via a mobile device. Now, the implications for that are profound because those devices uh, don't have big hard drives and, and unlimited storage uh, like a desktop machine or even a laptop. And that means that the technologies that we use are increasingly cloud-based and the networks that they're delivered on are utility networks, which means that they meet minimum standards, not maximum standards. We're not talking about gigabit kinds of networks, but uh, <coughs> GSM networks. And then finally, openness is one I'm going to talk a lot more about. We've noted that over the years we looked at open content, open data, open resources. All of those have been very important in education. Um, some very interesting recent developments in them. Uh, David Wiley would be interesting to talk to this week. Uh, but they blended with notions of transparency and easy access. And um, Many people commented that it's more than a trend anymore. It's, it's openness is a value for education. Something interesting to think about. So those are all contexts. Let me do a little pitch here. This is how we fund our project, one of the ways. But if you're interested in the data that we collect, we scan over 700 publications every single day um, via this incredible newsreader that we built. And then my research staff. Um, looks at the 30 or 40 that, that get highlighted from that, um, from that service. And we publish each week the top 10 news stories um, from technology in the horizon areas via this app that plays on iOS devices. It will be released on Android uh, in January. But it's also your doorway uh, to the entire library of every horizon report, every translation of every Horizon report and all the information in the NMC Navigator, which includes our data set of educational technology projects and all the readings that we've ever highlighted. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. Now, that's all context of the conversation I want to have today. And I, I think a lot um, in metaphors. And this is a photograph that I took in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And it is arguably before sunrise. It's 5.45 a.m. Um, and the world just has a different look in the morning. I, I love the mornings. You have such a sense of optimism that time of day. The potential is vast and, you know, the uh, it's just exciting time to, to be awake. And, and I like to think about those kinds of moments. This was a just a bit of serendipity looking out the window um, on a recent airplane flight. The kind of thing I recommend that you do is uh, open those window shades sometimes. You'd be surprised what might be out there. This is a particularly turbulent ride uh, because of all the cloud cover, but uh, look, look what was inside of it. And, you know, those are the kinds of things that we hope to uncover when we get into things with the Horizon Report. Um, this is a higher ed edition that was published in January. We just published this fall um, 
one focused just on STEM education. I thought I might highlight some of that one. Um, that was a worldwide report. And so I've compared it here. Um, the top 12 technologies that we that we highlighted, the regional reports highlight 12 technologies as opposed to six, um, and compares it to the higher ed report. And you can see that across all of these, cloud computing um, was very important as well as mobile apps. Um, but as you get a little further out, uh, it's interesting where STEM environments are heading. The idea of social networks um, is a plus, I think, that, that uh, STEM is moving very quickly into looking at ways to make math and science social. I think that's a really positive idea. Um, the notion of MOOCs uh, is very much on the on the horizon. We're going to talk a little bit more about MOOCs in a minute. There's much in the news, of course. Personal learning environments um, were um, are always are always something that comes up, and uh, and then even further out, uh, the notion of natural user interface is very very strong. And in STEM, even wearable technology, which I think is kind of fun, so uh, gives a sense there of, of how the mix is a little different. Every time we do a regional report, um, as we have here in uh, Latin America and Spain, uh, you have one, one perspective that's kind of related to the local challenges there. Um, higher ed has its own set, and then STEM has its own set as well. So anyway, another time for another gratuitous photograph. Uh, this is a picture of um, Big Ben in Westminster Parliament, taken from the top of the London Eye, not the kind of picture you usually see of the London Eye. And Peggy notes that so many things in a four to five year group are happening now but just begin to take off. That's, that's really a good point. Let me digress a little bit on that because it uh, it really is important in understanding how the work works. And so that first horizon, the next 12 months, that the one way to think about that is those are things that many schools are already doing something with. And really, there's an argument to be made that every school should be looking um, at those technologies, at least um, to understand them and to see if there are ways to, to, to integrate them. They're very close. In society, they would already be pervasive. Um, the middle term, a little further away, still some schools um, that are doing amazing things. All the technologies we identify have somebody uh, working on them. They're all uh, beyond the state of just being an idea, but have actual uh, demonstration efforts going on. That's one of our criteria for inclusion. But in the middle category, they're going to be more pervasive in other sectors like business or entertainment uh, or on the consumer side than in education. But beginning to come into education and uh, and just a couple, two or three years away. A good example is gaming. And you look at, like, the military. I mean, they do all of their training. Virtually 100% of it is done in a game or gamified environment with simulations. Um, and uh, some disciplines, like economics, extensively use gaming um, as a way to, to teach. Um, but in the mainstream, um, games haven't really quite taken on. There are plenty of people that use them and use them well. We know a lot about how they work, but they, they're just tantalizingly close to being mainstream, just not here yet. And then the things on the four to five year, um, definitely there are plenty of examples where you can see how that work is developing, um, but for reasons that may be more related to policies or um, the just systemic changes that need to take place, um, Sometimes they're out there more because of those reasons than others. So anyway, back to the eye here uh, and, uh, and to some more photographs. This is uh, an interesting little bit of uh, perception, other morning photograph also in Wyoming. This is a famous place called the Mormon Barn. And it's, again, very, very early in the morning. The sun is just uh, lighting up the tops of the mountains um, over there. 
And the only reason why the foreground is lit up is because it's a relatively long exposure. Um, anybody in America that aspires to be a great landscape photographer is going to make the trek one day to take this picture. And so there's something about it that you need to know. When you're looking this way, you've got the quintessential picture of the American West. But all you have to do is stand in exactly the same place and turn around, and you have a very different picture. And you can see four of the probably 50 photographers that were standing near me that day. You can also tell that looking back this way, the sun's not actually up yet um, where we can see it. And the only reason that it lights the mountains is because the angle is just right, which is one of the things that make an extraordinary picture. But what I love about the contrast between these two is that when you're looking one way, everything seems so bright and so clear, and it's like you understand it so well. But when you just stand in exactly the same place and look at it from another direction, it's kind of hazy and shadowy and not well lit at all. And all you've done is turn around and looked at it from another perspective. And that's what I'm going to try and do with you today. I'll admit I'm, I'm one of the top optimists in the, uh, in the world. I, I really do um, think that technology has changed my life for the better and millions and millions of other uh, people's lives as well. But we have to be um, objective and realize that, you know, that it's not all easy sometimes. There are things that we have to think through. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. And I'm going to pick on a couple of examples. One, much in the news, the idea of MOOCs. Um, Coursera just announced this week that they're going to begin offering credits uh, via uh, the association um, um, ACE, the American Council on Education. Um, hundreds of thousands of students have have taken it. And every time I read a story about MOOCs, I can't help but think about the Gartner um, hype curve. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, I just look at it and I think about where do you see MOOCs today? And I think that there are a tremendous number of inflated expectations for what MOOCs can do today. Um, and one of the reasons that I feel that way is because it's really changed from when um, it was originally piloted and, and uh, the, term, the term floated uh, a few years ago. Now, It's got great potential, but I want to I want to focus really on just the one word. Um, and open in the idea of a MOOC originally meant that the content was open and that the structure of the course was open, um, and that was the focus of it. And it was a way to have learning occur in multiple directions uh, in an online format. Um, with the idea that not only would the content that was used in the course be remixable, but it actually would be remixed uh, as a way to um, as a way to to look at it pedagogically, um, and so there were lots of of um, features of openness uh, in it. Now, in the, in the major brands, and I'll call them brands because that's basically what they have going for them, I think, um, open has come to mean something very different. In the open university, for example, it meant open access, which uh, was kind of a, a way to go uh, to university if maybe you hadn't picked university uh, as your track when you were in, in high school. Uh, you know, second chance kind of institution sort of way, led, led by the uh, Great Open University in the UK. Now, uh, dozens and dozens of open universities around the world. But the notion around MOOCs with open is free. That the learning is free. Now, that's a powerful idea that learning would be free. I, I would be hard pressed to argue against that. I think learning should be free. Um, I don't know if I feel the same way about courses. And one thing that I think books that are doing that is very positive is they're causing us to think 
differently about learning as opposed to the structure that we use to uh, to make learning happen. And um, so anyway, it's just something to think about on that, that notion of openness um, and where it goes. Um, this was our, our one of our top meta trends, um, as I mentioned a moment ago. And there was a, a comment placed in the write-up of it that uh, there's a need for more curation and other forms of validation uh, to generate meaning. And I think that's what Coursera and Udacity and edX are trying to do. They're trying to curate uh, information associated with well-known uh, exclusive brands. And it's pretty clear that people are interested in that. And uh, so I would follow this notion of openness. I think it's, it's really important because in the end, it really is all about us this thing about learning, the network, the technology. Uh, it's, it's us that it's about. It's not about the thing. It's about how we use it and what it does for us and how it makes our lives better. And that's kind of the, the point that I want to make in this talk, that you know, in the end, really all this is about us. And we, it's OK for us to think about it in that way. And so what I want to do is I want to pick uh, Another technology, a second one, this one's a little more general, the idea of the network. And I want to look at it um, through the eyes of uh, a number of generations of people. I'm going to choose my own family for this sort of discussion and talk about how the concept of a network has changed just in my lifetime. And um, and in the people that I know, the people that I'm most close to, my own family, how they think about it, and how it's affected and changed my own thinking over my life. And the point that I'm trying to make uh, in this set of little stories is that we need to be aware that our own history, our own expertise, really limits us. All the training and all the knowledge that we have has gotten us to the places that we are. But it's only going to help us get to the places we need to go to the extent that we continue to learn and continue to uh, and continue to see things as as uh, as important to know. So so I'm going to start with this notion. This is a notion that I learned as a little boy. And this is my father's view of the network, that the network connects us. Uh, my dad was a soldier. He uh, grew up in the Depression era and World War II. And um, the technology that was important to him in his life was radio. Radio to him, he saw it change his world profoundly. And the notion of a network to him was this. The network was CBS. <clears throat> it was NBC. It was the way that the news was communicated around the world. That was a network, the notion of a radio network. And this was the device that, um, that he viewed as integral to understanding and using that network. And for those of you who don't know what this is, it's a radio. It's a, it's a hand-built radio. My dad and I built dozens of these. This particular one is an AM FM radio <clears throat> and has two crystals. And uh, you subscribe to that antenna book. And, and I remember radios in this way <clears throat> for, uh, for many, many years. We listened to um, the uh, Sonny Liston, um, at that time he was called Cassius Clay, a boxing match when we were stationed in Libya. And uh, the match was in Atlantic City and got at like 3 in the morning. It was amazing that we could hear it all the way across the world. And my dad never hesitated to help me understand the science of radio and why we could do that and why radio waves work better at night uh, because there wasn't as much energy in the air to, uh, from, from the sun. The photons turning into elect electrons and all the collisions going on allowed the radio waves to to travel much further, and so 
it was better for us to listen to radio late at night and all of these kinds of things that he would convince me of. And we had, it was fascinating the way he looked at it. And he devoted his entire life to it. Um, radio was his technology. Ultimately, it became um, radar. And that's what he focused on in the military. And radar, of course, became a technology that allowed uh, World War II to, to come to a quicker close, one of them. And um, he was always very proud of that. And then ultimately, the same technology moved into lasers. And he always would remind me how you know, it was kind of the same thing, only smaller waveforms. And he just ran with it his whole life. That was his technology. And he didn't even really make the jump, uh, you know, to the really obvious next new technology in the network, <clears throat> which was this, the television. And I'll be honest, this is my growing up. I remember uh, doing this at Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. The Beverly Hillbillies would come on, and I would be so excited. And I even still remember the theme songs from some of these shows. Let me tell you all the story about a man named Jed. <laughs> Poor Mountain and barely kept his family fed. And, you know, we would all come together around this, and the next day we'd all talk about the shows. And, and it was really something. And, and I, I agree with my dad. I felt that the network connected us. But as I began to, to, you know, to come of age, I realized that there were other perspectives. The shadows around this notion of the network connecting us were beginning to uh, reveal themselves and to show some substance and some depth. And at the head of that pack, of course, the great work of Marshall McLuhan, um, who um, basically was making the point that the network was changing us, that, the, that we had always communicated, but that these new mass medias were, were changing us in ways that we didn't understand and we couldn't understand the impact of. And that was about the time that I was you know, really starting to come with age. And I remember two incidents that I'm going to share with you that, that illustrate that for me. This is one of them. This is the moment, this is Walter Cronkite. For those of you in the U.S., I'm sure you'll know who this is. But um, in the time that I grew up, he was the most trusted newsman in America. And we used to have trusted newsmen <laughs> in America. That was, that was an interesting notion back then. But someone had just handed him a note He'd take his glasses off uh, to pause as he read it with the news that John F. Kennedy had just died. And when he read that news over the network, an amazing thing happened. The world stopped. For three days, a collective sense of mourning, profoundly in the U.S., but, but arguably all around the world, and, in fact, the network did change us. We felt very connected. We felt, you know, the sense of outrage about the whole thing. And it was, it was really, really new. And then a few years later, it's 1968. And, uh, again, in America, you know, we are still coming to grips with uh, this notion of live news. And it was the election season. We just had an election last week in the U.S. And at the Democratic national convention, there began to be riots outside against the war in Vietnam. And the response of the police was something that most of us in America who didn't live in well, there are places where this happened all too often, but most of us had never, had never seen anything like this. And it shocked us. And it shocked me in particular in a form of political view. Honestly, this one experience for my whole life, I've been influenced by that. And that kind of takes it to, to where I began to think about the network differently because I had that experience and I bought into the notion that it connected us. And I also bought into the notion that it changed us. But there was a new notion when I went to, when I went to college to study computer science, which was a brand new field. And that notion was the network could help us. And there was a... Uh, a prophet in many ways that uh, that I learned about in 1968. And his name is Douglas Engelbart. And uh, I don't have an easy way to show you this little video clip, but I'm just going to talk you through it. Um, this frame is taken from a video of what's been called the mother of all demos. And in 1968, Doug Engelbart, in one amazing 
about 30 minute demo demonstrated two way video conferencing, um, hyperlinking, graphic user interfaces, the mouse, um, and virtually every other technology that we count on and routinely use today. In fact, on the anniversary of this, the 40th anniversary, Alan Kay noted, you know, what is Silicon Valley going to do when they run out of Ingebart's ideas? Well, when we think about devices, um, we're there. We've been, we've been using the keyboard mouse uh, win Windows metaphor for computing as the state of the art since 1968. And now it's 2012. And so, you know, you can do the math. That's almost 35 years. That's uh, more than, no, it's almost 45 years. It's been a mighty long time. And in this era is when we go to the next. I remember my family, my son. I spent all my career, as probably a lot of you did, you know, arguing that we needed networks, arguing that we needed email, arguing that we needed this in the classroom and that in the classroom, and being a real advocate for, um, you know, computer networks and computer technology. And I had the feeling the whole time that those served a purpose really different from television networks and radio networks, that they were there to augment our capacity and to help us to do things that we couldn't do normally. And I was talking with my son when I was thinking about these remarks, and I, when I played with this topic a, a few times, and he says, well, yeah, that's, that's interesting stuff, but you got it wrong. He's never been hesitant to tell me that, uh, but in this case, he was, he was right. I, I did have it wrong, because he, what he said was, Dad, it isn't that the network connects us or changes us or helps us. The network is us. There's no purpose for the network without us. And it was like a light bulb came on because I realized that his entire perception of the network was different than mine. Because he wasn't the person that went in on the weekend to pull the cables in the school buildings to make the internet like I did. He didn't care where the internet came from. As far as he was concerned, the internet was just there. And its only reason to exist was to connect us. And, and I began to think about the implications of that. And you know, remember that slide I had from Franklin Roosevelt with all the microphones around? That's, that's how the news used to happen. And it still happens that way sometimes. And we had an election, and sure enough, you know, the candidates had plenty of that stuff around them. But when breaking news happens, news that we don't know exactly when it's going to be, it gets captured with devices like this. And if you go to any major news gathering organization, CNN or whatever your, your choice, there's going to be a place right on their homepage, send us your cell phone video because they want to know where the news happens. And I want to illustrate that in a couple powerful ways. And all of these are examples that my son would real would would highlight as completely natural uh, implications of the network. And so this is the first. This is the first image that came out of Haiti. And although the problem still exists in Haiti, the outpouring of help that came after those horrible earthquakes uh, initially, I think were caused by the way that we learned about it. This is not a journalist's photograph. A journalist would be looking to tell the story. This person was looking to convey the pain, the panic, the disorientation that he or she was feeling. I can imagine the person taking the picture looking just like the guy in the truck. This is a person that had experienced exactly the same thing and was just reacting. And that picture went around the world virally, almost instantly. And we also had new ways that people could give micro donations. And they gave them all over the world. And it fundamentally impacted how we began to think about how to respond to disasters and change things um, really forever from a cell phone picture 
This is another remarkable example that my son would list as just a completely natural outgrowth of the way we're connected. And one that surprised, I think, uh, virtually everyone of my generation. This is the Facebook page, We Are All Khalid Saeed, that was created to honor a young man in Tunisia who immolated himself uh, in protest over government policies there. And we all know the story um, of um, this Facebook page. It became um, a rallying point for the Arab Spring. And it led, amazingly, in just a couple of weeks to this, where hundreds of thousands of people were gathered in downtown Cairo to protest the government in a completely different country nearby, but a completely different country. Different policies, but oppression uh, felt in quite the same way. And the amazing thing that happened here, and another thing that my son would say, well, it don't, would you expect that to happen? Is that the government shut the internet down in the whole country. The whole country. And what happened? The internet repaired itself. We repaired ourselves. And that Facebook page was back up in hours. It was astounding how much that network represented some very important things. Notions of freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, of religion, of expression, freedom of assembly and choice and association, all those values are tied up in the modern view of what the Internet is and how it connects us. This is so different than the network that I thought I was helping to build. And in fact, the network I did help to build. Who knew that it would become something like this? We have no idea of the potential, the social potential. We saw the Arab Spring. We saw SOPA and PIPA. And it just amazes us that, you know, overnight a few websites go black and we stop legislation in its track. Excellent comment, Veronica. Actually, it's easier than ever to be a leader nowadays but not in the traditional way. The people that led this effort didn't use, they weren't elected, they didn't use any of the traditional mechanisms, and in fact they walked away uh, after, after it was back. So that's one aspect of the network that is changed. And one reason why it can be that way is because really the network is just about everywhere. I'm going to show you powerfully, I hope, what I mean by that. This is a picture of the Earth at night, or if you like, this is a picture of the electric grid. This is where the lights are. This is where the electricity is. Let me show you another map, virtually the same projection. And this is a map of the GSM networks, the 3G networks, if you like. Um, and it's about a year old, so they're actually more expensive than this map shows because they grow uh, phenomenally year to year. But look at Australia, for example. Okay, you can clearly see, you know, Brisbane and and you know, and just all the cities here. Here's Perth over on the other side, and, and Melbourne down here, and Sydney, and but here you can see all the cities, and you can see that Europe is really lit up. Um, you know, but Africa, the center of Africa, virtually dark, as well as the Amazon basin. And look at, look at the GSM networks again. Australia, 3G reaches deep into the outback. It reaches deep into the Amazon basins coming in from the coast, particularly in Argentina. Look how well Argentina is covered. Uh, Africa, East Africa in particular, excellent cell coverage. We went on a break uh, last spring. My wife and I had a chance to go to a meeting in, in Tanzania. And so we decided to make a, a family holiday out of it. 
and go on safari. And my wife was so excited. She said, "You're gonna, you're gonna finally get off the grid. You're gonna be like ten days, no internet, no phone. It's gonna be the best thing ever." And I'm going, "Okay, yeah, maybe I'm probably gonna." Probably going to have my arm shake off just because I won't know what to do, but I'll go and it'll be wonderful. And uh, so we're out in the middle of the Serengeti, and I didn't realize that I even had my phone or that it was even on, but I was taking the long because it was a camera, and um, all of a sudden it rings, and I pull out 3G five bars, and we're 80 kilometers from the nearest even a building. <laughs> you know, the internet really is everywhere. So, you know, the Earth at night, you can see the developed countries extremely lit up, um, you know, with electricity, and even more so with mobile. So that uh, it's, it's, it's just amazing how fast it expands. And the reason is because it's so easy. And this is a cell phone tower, a mobile cell phone tower I saw in Qatar in the um, Arabian Peninsula. And it literally uh, is something you can drag out and drop off um, the back of your pickup truck. It's got a trailer hitch, got solar panels on the top for power and backup generator. You stand up the tower and you've just extended your network by a radius of 60, not a radius, a radius of 30 miles. And you've extended the network by 60. Um, this is so easy that you remember the stories they had of when the iPhone came out. Out, they would bring down the network in San Francisco. They have a big conference or somewhere else. Well, you don't read those stories anymore because these same kinds of mobile trucks, uh, AT and T and Verizon and Sprint, all have fleets of them, and they send them all over the country wherever all the people are gathering to bring in additional cell capacity. It's so easy to do it. The network is just expanding. And then they have cell phone accounts. This is another slide that's a little bit old. We passed 6 billion active cell phone accounts um, in July 2011. We're uh, going to hit 7 billion uh, sometime in the next few weeks. By 2014, there will be more active phones than people on the planet. And there will be 100% active cell phone coverage in Africa. Now, that doesn't mean that 100% of the people in Africa will have a cell phone, because some will have more than one. But it means that the penetration rate will be 100% across Africa, which is amazing. Uh, today, 96% of those phones, 1.3 billion new phones sold every year, um, 96% of the phones that exist already can access the Internet. 100% of the phones that are being manufactured can access the Internet. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, 90% of people in the world use their mobile device to access the Internet. Now, think about kids in primary and secondary school. What is the network to them? The concept doesn't really convey any meaning anymore. The network is just invisible. It's just something that exists. And when I think about my little granddaughter, who's the last uh, stop on, you know, almost the last stop, because I have a grandson too. <laughs> You're going to get to see both of them uh, on, the, on this little family history trail here. Um, what is the network going to mean to her in her life? Well, it, it's going to be all the things that it meant to her great grandfather and her grandfather me and her and her father um, but it's also something that I don't expect that she's going to think much about she's just going to expect it to be there the same way that we just expect that when you flip a light switch a light comes on in fact that's how you get light you flip the switch you know, I mean, we don't think about we should probably if we want to be ecological, but we don't really think about where the electricity comes from. And at the end of the day, we don't actually really care. We just want the lights to come on. And I think that's kind of the way it is. And so when I call Ava Marie and talk to her on the phone, I'm not always on a wireless network, so I can't always do FaceTime. But she asks me every single time, Grandpa, why aren't we using FaceTime? What, you know, in her mind, it's like, why would you ever have just an audio call? <laughs> uh, 
Why would you have just an audio call if you could have a video call? Well, would you want to do that, Grandpa? Come on, Grandpa. Let's do this. Yeah, and the devices we have are changing. And they're not going to know the devices that we know. My grandson here, he's not going to probably ever use a computer that has a keyboard. He's one year old in this picture, and in that little Piaget moment, I gave him my iPad to just kind of see what he would do. And, you know, it, it took about a minute, ten minutes maybe, to just kind of pound on it. We'd be saying, oh, no, no, don't don't break it. You know, it's made of glass. You know, just, just gently, you know, here, try this, and we'd show him how to swipe it. And eventually he figured it out, and he, and he and he made the mental connection. Wow, I just I just do this, and wow, and oh, I can do this, and I can. And he just went through every single icon on the device until the battery ran dead, and to, to and taught himself everything on there. I mean, the kid is two now. He can take photographs. He can send me the photographs in SMS. He can make a FaceTime call. He can look up any game he wants on the machine and play it. He can take video. The kid can't even really talk yet. Yet here he goes, and um, you know, off off on this. It's it's kind of amazing to see. Now, just think about it. Who's working on the next generation keyboard? Nobody. The next generation of computing devices. This is the first wave. They're going to get more natural, more intuitive, easier to use, smaller, lighter, more powerful. By the time this kid is in high school, that's going to be his expectation, is that the devices are with him all the time, that he can access any information he needs all the time. And so, this brings me to the end, and we can go to open questions in a minute, but, you know, I like to ask myself often, am I making plans to get more radios in the world? Am I, is my thinking defined by the way that I came up? and learn computing, and, you know, I said, oh, no, I mean, yeah, I learned punch cards, but, you know, I know how to use a, a mouse today, and I have an iPad and all of that stuff. But it, it's, it's a serious question, you know, and we don't want to be thinking about our schools as places where this kind of technology is what we provide. We need to be providing a technology that feels not only invisible, um, but really like air. And I like to think about I think that's different than invisible. It doesn't mean transparent. Air is transparent. But there's some things about air that technology is to me that I think we need to have it be for the people in our schools. Air sustains us. We can't live without the air. If there's no air, it's a bad thing. <laughs> we have to have it. But when we move through it, it moves out of the way like it wasn't there. It doesn't impede what we see. In fact, it can help us to move things. It can help us to, to fly in an airplane. It can help us to, to rise high in a, in a balloon. It's got some interesting characteristics that make it uh, fun to study in and of itself, but mostly we want the air to not be in the way. And that's what we want about the network. Somebody suggested the other day that any time someone comes up with a, you know, a, um, a question or a concern about a technology, that you replace the name of that technology with pencil. You know, like, should we ban pencils in high schools? You know, should we allow writing with pencils? It's just not as good as ink. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's kind of where we bring it to the end, you know. And when we want to teach kids about electricity, it doesn't matter what the technology is that we convey it with, whether it's distant learning or over the internet or, or hands-on. The thing that's important is that we help them to, to, to see the magic in understanding what electricity is. The same way that this kid 
is experiencing it with a plasma goal. This is the goal that we should have for kids is in learning. We want to make their mouths drop with the realization the world is so cool that it's worth learning about, that it's worth learning about deeply. And if there's anybody that can do it, it's us. We're the network. That's where it started. The network is us. It's all about us. And so uh, I'm going to stop here and uh, take, take any questions that people have. And uh, thank you all very, very much for giving me this chance to, to uh, be part of this amazing, amazing conference. Thank you. So if you have a question for Larry, please feel free to put it in the chat or you can raise your hand, hand icon. I don't know if this is the kind of presentation that's going to generate questions. I think there's been some deep reflection. Thanks, Larry. I'll take pushback, too. <laughs> if you think that any of this, you know, just was off base, it's your turn. You know, I think uh, Peggy says it all. One of the other things we do need to be aware of here is that we have sessions starting at the top of the hour, so this may be just a good moment to close. Uh, so why don't we do that? Larry, I'm going to clap for you. The applause icon is not quite hard to find, but hover over the smiley face and look for the applause. Or just raise your hand, of course, <laughs> the default, and Larry will know what it means. Love that final slide as well. Was thinking about that as you showed the slide of just the three or four photographers. Okay, enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. And um, I'll put my um, email in uh, in the chat. And if you have any follow-ups with me, just let me know. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you much. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for making the time this week. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We'll close the session down and encourage you to go to, the, to one of the next sessions coming up. Take care and bye. Bye now.